The Christian and his neighbor, this is the last in the series. We're looking at the faithful steward. We are not owners, we are stewards. <laughs> it makes a difference in life. If you realize you're a steward, you have to give an account. Conscientious supervision of the affairs of God's household, the church. Before we look at the message of the interesting parable, let's look at the parables and their interpretation. It's good to refresh our minds. The English word parable is from the Greek parabole, a just position, a comparison, an illustration, a parable, a proverb. By the way, just a little Greek lesson. <laughs> there are two words that's being used from, from. The one is para and the other one is ek. Ek means it comes from something else. But para, parallel, is different. And whenever it refers to Jesus, it's not using the Greek ek, something from something. No, it's always para. Jesus is parallel to God the Father. He's equal in every aspect. It comes from a verb meaning to put one thing by the side of another. For comparison, to throw beside. The Greek parabole and its Hebrew equivalent are broader in meaning than a word parable. According to the English definition, a parable is a narrative whose primary purpose is to teach truth. In literary form, it is an extended metaphor. Many of Christ's parables were brief to the point of being metaphors or proverbs. So you, you, you cannot just Put a parable in any category you like. It's, it's, it's a bit broader and deeper. In the Gospels, a parable is a narrative, a story placed alongside para, a certain spiritual truth for purposes of comparison. You know, this helps us to understand the Bible because your word is a lamp unto my foot and a light unto my path. The Bible explains itself in the most beautiful literary, literary styles. The parables of our Lord were usually based on common experiences of everyday life familiar to his hearers. It was so simple but so deep. Often in a specific incident that had recently occurred or that they could see at the time. So here he's, he's telling them, a parable. A sower, like the picture, went out to sow. And then he elaborates on this. And he brings out the beautiful messages that he wants them to understand. The narrative itself was simple and brief. It was not pulled out, extended. And its conclusion usually so obvious as to involve no uncertainty. You knew exactly what Jesus was trying to tell people when he gave them parables. Placed alongside the spiritual truth, it was designed to illustrate. Let me explain this to you, Jesus said. It's like this or that. The parable thus became a bridge by which the hearers might be led to understand and appreciate the truth. So you walk from this side, the narrative, and then there's a, a bridge to take you to the other side of deeper spiritual truth. It met the people where they were. There was a sower. There was a man who had two sons or whatever. And by a pleasant and familiar path, led their thoughts to where Jesus sought to direct them. He is a master speaker and teacher and saviour. It was a window through which the soul might gaze 
upon vistas of heavenly truth. By parables, Jesus aroused interest. You have to get somebody to be interested in your subject. So he used methods to arouse interest, attention, and inquiry. He wanted people to ask questions. Point two, imparted unwanted truth without arousing prejudice. <laughs> Man, this is so beautiful when you read the parables. The Pharisees were so careful. But uh, they would say, yes, they would be killed. And then they condemn themselves. That's the un unfaithful servant, for instance. Point three, evaded the spies by pursued him relentlessly. He evaded them. They were in every audience where he addressed people. So the parables, they couldn't pin him down on something because it's a parable. <laughs> For created in the minds of his hearers as lasting impressions that would be renewed and intensified when the scenes presented in the parables again came to mind or to the view. There was a, a, a lost sheep. So whenever they saw a strange sheep, they went back to the parable. Beautifully done. Restored nature as an avenue for knowing God. Yeah, we look at, you plant something and the electricity of God comes into it and it grows. So, and then he goes to the mysteries of his Father. Parables revealed the truth of those willing to receive it and at times concealed it from others. In studying the parables of Jesus, it is most important to follow sound principles of interpretation. These principles may briefly be summed as follows. As follows. Point number one, a parable is a mirror by which truth can be seen. It is not truth itself, like the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There's no such thing as two people and they are talking to one another. And the bosom of Adam, Abraham so big that every saved sinner could sit on that, you know. Okay, you get, you get the point. A parable is a mirror by which truth can be seen. It is not truth itself. The context in which a parable is given, the place, circumstances, persons to whom it was spoken, and the problem under discussion must be taken into consideration and made the key to interpretation. All these parables are so beautiful. Point number three, Christ's own introduction and conclusion to the parable generally make its fundamental purpose clear. A man had two sons. Point four, every parable illustrates one fundamental aspect of spirituality. Details of a parable are significant only as they contribute to the clarification of that particular point of truth. To fully comprehend the parable's spiritual meaning, fully comprehend it, one must have a good understanding of the circumstances it describes in terms of oriental customs, modes of thought, and ways of expression. And that's why it's very good to do a little study of archaeology in the Bible, and you can find this in my series, Digging Up the Past. Parables are vivid word pictures that must be seen, so to speak, before they can be understood. I want to read this again. Parables are vivid word pictures that must be seen, so to speak, before they can be understood. Next point six. Since a parable is fundamentally intended to represent truth, usually one specific truth, no theory may be based on the trivial aspects of the parable. Leave that, get the main point. Point seven, the parable, in whole and in part, must be interpreted in terms of the truth it is designed to teach. 
as set forth in the literal language, in the immediate context, and elsewhere in the scripture. So Jesus was a perfect orator, a perfect presenter of parables. He followed all the rules. Let's ask Luke to shed more light upon the servant-master relationship. And the Lord said, Who is then that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make a ruler over his household? to give them their portion of food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler of all that he has. Do you realize that we will be rulers in the year after? Maybe ten planets with people. There's so many surprises waiting for us. This is what the word of God says. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. Oh no, second coming is another thousand years or hundred years. There's no imminence in our preaching today. My friend, Jesus can come tomorrow. And when we die, that's the second coming in a way. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and the female servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him to, and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. The people of the flood, before the flood, the antediluvians never thought this would happen. The people in Sodom never thought this would happen. Be ready, Jesus says, be ready. That expectation must always be alive in our hearts, the second coming of Jesus. In my time, and if it's not in my time, it will come. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. By the way, the everlasting fire is unfair, because Jesus says, you will be punished according to your guilt. He's a loving God, he will get our due, ten of the best or five of the best, and then it's all over. He will not punish people throughout eternity. Let's ask Matthew to shed more light upon the servant-master relationship. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made the ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? This is the second of six illustrations given to show the importance of watching and of being ready. This parable applies especially to the religious and spiritual leaders of the household of faith. So if you're involved in the working of the church, no matter what kind of position you have, this is for you. It was their duty to provide for the needs of its members and who by precept and example are to witness their belief in the nearness of Christ's coming. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Lately I'm telling people, I just meet strangers, telling them, you know what? God is going to make an end to the misery we're in. Jesus is coming. Let you, let you and I be of those that will be in his new kingdom. It is the shepherd's duty to feed the flock of God and to set it an example of watchfulness and preparedness. This is how we should serve God. God will require an accounting of his flock and it behooves each shepherd to discharge faithfully the responsibility entrusted to him. And you're a shepherd if you've got young children in your house. 
you are the shepherd, you've got to lead them. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. This is the cosmos. A ruler over parts of the cosmos. Ah, what a thought. That is, he will be entrusted with greater responsibilities. Be faithful in the least and you'll be rewarded in greater responsibilities. Compare the experience of Joseph in the house of Potiphar. What is this picture telling us? He graduated from the prison and became the prime minister of Egypt. He was faithful in everything he did. In Potiphar's house and in the jail, the prison. Man, that prison shone like a star. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, the evil servant may not admit openly that he believes his Lord is delayed, but his way of life betrays him. He does not act as if he believed his Lord would soon return. The preacher would not fly in a jet from place to place and drive a Rolls Royce. No. He's a servant. But his words lack conviction. He is not in dead earnest. He's just saying words. His life and labors proclaim that he does not really believe his Lord is coming soon. This is the blessed hope. 1,500 times it's there in the Bible. In the time of crisis, he does not stand between the dead and the living. He does not minister in season, out of season. Nor does he reprove, rebuke, exhort. No, it's just grace, grace, grace. Rather, he adapts his message to the itching ears of his parishioners. No. Give them the truth and they'll respect you, appreciate you. He forgets that the message of Christ's soon coming is designed to arouse men from their absorption of worldly things. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and beginning to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. This is a very interesting sight. I did research here. Uh, it's too much to tell you, but you can watch my research on the story of Nebuchadnezzar. The devastated ruins of ancient Nippur, biblical Kalne, tells about the prophet Ezekiel and his description of the shepherds of Jerusalem. And you know, when I visit these sites, I, I wondered where did he sit to write this? Of course, the 10,000 exiles were also there and had wonderful visions next to the Keba River. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. And if you're a shepherd in Israel, this is a message for you, for me. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flocks? When you're a pastor, you should be poor because you are helping people, inviting them to your home. You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened. You didn't do home visitation. Nor have you healed those who were sick. Nor bound up the broken nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled over them. Pastors, fellow workers for God, let's take note of what Jesus says here through Ezekiel. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. What a sad situation. 
and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains. Oh, and I think Ezekiel was crying when he wrote this down. And on every high hill, yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. And Jesus was weeping. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I learn, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. A lady attended my lectures. And when I visited that home, she said, you know, every time my pastor comes here, he takes me to bed. She said, I was so upset. A preacher! And she told me she can't get, she can't get rid of him. So I phoned him. Now I went to him. I said, listen, if you visit that home once more, I will tell your wife and your congregation and your leaders. You should feed people, not destroy people. Listen to the description of Jesus concerning the good and the bad servants. And we have to ask ourselves, where do we fit into this picture between the bad and the good servants? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. All his goods. That is, he will be entrusted with greater responsibilities. Compare the experience of Joseph in the house of Potiphar. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A painful and shameful form of capital punishment in which the body was cut in pieces with a sword instead of being decapitated. This is what a bad shepherd will receive because he destroyed the flock. He has a portion with hypocrites because he has lived and acted the part of a hypocrite. We've had the greatest scandals about ministers, men of the cloth in our country, maybe in your country as well. You feel so ashamed and they're ruining the name of the gospel. Let's look at the behavior of a few other servants. And again, where do we fit into this picture? And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. Huh? So, hey. Yeah. By the way, we've got no rights in this life. We only have privileges, not demands, but thankfulness for what you've got. It seems that this brief parable was spoken in answer to the request recorded in verse 5. Let's read it again. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in the field, come at once and sit down to eat? Now he continues the story. Luke 17, verse 7. And which of you, having a servant plowing? The master's home would probably be in a village or town and his land not far away. So they lived in the city and they worked outside. <clears throat> 
Usually the servant would leave town in the morning to work in the fields and then return in the evening. He even said, said to his servant, listen man, you did a great job. Come and sit down, eat, eat, eat. And no. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper. This is the good steward. Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk. And afterward, you will eat and drunk. Think, that, that, that's how things were in Oriental times. But he will, but will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. This is how servants were treated. And the audience knew about this. So likewise you, when you've done all those things which you are commanded to say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Don't live on compliments. You've already received much blessings just to have a job. Don't wait on the boss to praise you and uplift you. Do your duty. Feed your boss first. See that he's fine. Then go home, and then you can come and eat. A servant has got to know his place. And this is what Jesus did. He left everything. He came down and he washed the feet of his disciples. He never asked for a thank you or a compliment. That is, we deserve no special commentation. And my friend, we don't need any special commentation. The master has received his due from them, but nothing more is worth mentioning. He has not profited by their service to the extent that he should feel obliged to show them special honor. They had a job. What a privilege. There are millions without jobs. They have their wages, and that is all they should expect. You know, you've got people that are expecting more and more and more and more and more. He's under no obligation to them. In other words, Jesus had a right to expect much of his disciples, his servants. And God has a right to expect much of us today. Forget about incentives. Do your job. When we have done our best for him, we... We do not thereby place him under any particular obligation to us. Did you get this? When we have done our best for him, I know we're doing our best for him. We do not thereby place him under any particular obligation to us. No. We've done our job, we've got our pay. We have done no more than by right we should do. Paul reflects on the spirit of true service when he remarks that all he has endured and suffered for Christ's sake is nothing to glory of. Don't tell people how smart you are or how kind you are to people and expect some credit. No, Paul says, nothing to glory of, nothing. His service was motivated by a profound sense of obligation to his master. In preaching the gospel, he was discharging a weighty obligation. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And my friend, woe unto you and me if we do not live out the things we believe we should do. Next time. Oh, this is a beautiful parable. It's about the wedding, meeting the bridegroom. Father in heaven, at times we are spiritually arrogant. Help us to do our job because it is an honor to work for you, to be kind to people, to serve their needs. Help us to be faithful servants. Help us not to not to extract money 
and favor from people. Help us to do our job and not complain about doing our job. May we not have expectations, except expectations for ourselves to do the best for our master. Help us to think on these things. In Jesus' name,